Hello, and welcome to our discussion on competition and cooperation, the global promise of a technology Olympics. My name is Matt Breiza. I'm a former U.S. diplomat, spent 23 years in the U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, I ended up as ambassador to Azerbaijan, spent four years in the White House, many years inside the State Department. Uh, and I'm here with a group of friends of mine who are trying to do something innovative uh, and I think really great for the world. Uh, we begin from the thought that as competition among the world's great powers increases, technology is increasing in economic, security, and political battleground. Over the past 130 years, the Olympics have become a vehicle for channeling athletic competition into a sense of global goodwill. Today, a new Olympiad that will identify the world's most talented people in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics could do the same, while identifying also ways to find the next potential pandemic sooner, avert a global climate catastrophe, and improve the quality of life for billions of people. Uh, I'd like to turn first to a very close friend of mine named Steve Hellman, uh, who came up with this idea of pursuing uh, a global technical, a technological Olympics. Uh, Steve is a phenomenal entrepreneur. He has built and sold over 20 companies. Uh, his current venture is called Mobility Impact Partners, which is a collaborative strategic investment platform uh, for emerging mobility ecosystems. Uh, it builds on a, a previous fund that he developed called Energy Impact Partners, which tries to has brought together uh, people who are investing in renewable energy, uh, smart grids, uh, cybersecurity, and a whole range of technologies, again, in a collaborative platform. Um, but Steve has built and sold other companies involved with, uh, well, oil tankers, uh, real estate, and, and for me, most importantly, worked at the U.S. Department of State during 2006 and 2007, interacting with heads of state and ministers of various countries, uh, trying to help our European allies uh, secure and diversify the supplies of uh, oil and natural gas. We did that as a team. Uh, it built a friendship between Steve and me. And Steve, I'd like to ask you, if you will, to outline uh, your vision of what a technology Olympiad could be. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for bringing this group together. Um, I, I would say that none of that background is at all relevant to the conversation today, but um, I'll certainly try to at least set the table for the conversation. And I, the idea is, is painfully simple, right? Um, create an Olympics style international competition around technology, everything from math to hacking and from physics to robotics. The first, we'd, we'd hope that we'd be able to launch um, the first such Olympiad in the summer of 2023 to be the off season for the Olympics or the off years, if you would, if you would, for the Olympics um, in, in Athens. Um, the Olympiad should include uh, events for individuals. In other words, there'd be like a gold medal for a math champion. It should include events for teams like robotics and potentially even events for corporations or institutions, things, for example, around quantum computing, which would require that type of infrastructure. Now, let's start with why. Why do this, right? Putting aside the fact that I think this could be an extremely valuable platform. I mean, after all, um, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, earns about $1.4 billion a year. So there's a way to um, make this a sustainable business without any doubt. But putting that aside, every country in the world is trying to promote science and technology among its youth. Not for, not, not for the heck of it, but for extremely good reasons. The challenges that we face as a society, whether they're health or security or prosperity, or even our very existence of our species, um, if not many, many other species as well, is all boiling down to advancements in technology and innovation. And every political leader and every corporate leader understands this. Now, the last time that there was a real surge in interest in engineering and technology was 1969, the Apollo moon landing. And why? Because we had heroes. We had Neil Armstrong. Everybody in the world knows the name Neil Armstrong because he was a national hero in science and technology and drove tremendous interest in science and technology. Um, the Athletic Olympics does a terrific job focusing young people on sports, and everybody knows Michael Phelps and Sean White. The, the point of the Technology Olympics is to do the same, to mint national heroes 
in technology to act as role models to drive interest in the fields. Now, how to do this? Creating something on the order of magnitude of the Olympics is not a trivial exercise by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't want to minimize any of the thousands of things that we would need to accomplish in order to do that. But I would focus our current thinking around two major challenges. The one is the diplomatic challenge. Thus, you know, the Matt Bryza world, if you will. Um, how to bring 197 countries together to participate in something of this scale. I actually think that's a, that's possibly a smaller challenge than we currently think about it in terms of 197 countries. I, I really believe that if we were able to get the Chinese, the Americans, and perhaps the Russians to buy into the idea that you'd have the inertia to get the rest of the world to participate. And so I think there's a, there's, if you will, there's a, there's an MVP, a minimum viable product, a way of going about that exercise that can solve that problem. The second big issue is how do we make this interesting? How do we attract mm -hmm. broad media attention to a bunch of, uh, a bunch of people, um, solving math problems, for example, because that's not going to create the same excitement as Usain Bolt breaking the world record for the 100 meter dash. Now, I think there are there are if we follow the model of the Olympics, the Olympics has 400 events. How many of us can name even even 14 of them? The reality <laughs> is that that there are a subset of those events that really drive interest. And the same thing here. We can have hundreds of events across multiple technology disciplines, each of which will find an audience in that particular niche. But what we really need to focus on is developing the dozen or so events, whether that's things like battle bots or things like gaming or whatever that already have audiences of millions and millions of people to kind of drive the broader media interest and create the, the, create the platform in which we can embrace all of these other events. So those are the two sort of like key challenges that we're focused on, but I don't want to minimize the, 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 the breadth and the scale of the challenges involved in bringing an event like this to life. And what I would hope is that anybody here listening that would be interested uh, would reach out to us with ideas, with um, potential interest in getting involved. Um, by all means, reach out to info, at technologyolympics.org. That's I-N-F-O at technologyolympics, one word, dot org. We'd love to hear from you. It's going to take much more than a village. It's going to take a world to put yeah. together this um, technology Olympiad. And we'd, we'd, love to, we'd love to work with anybody out there that would have interest. Back to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for not only uh, laying out for us the general vision of what this could be and why it's important, but also the challenges. Um, about making it entertainmently worthwhile. Uh, and there are also questions of financing. You mentioned the business model as well. I mean, we have to attract sponsors and you know, f come up with the funding to be able to make it happen. Um, but before we get into those questions, uh, maybe we could talk about what, what are the antecedents out there? What sort of examples of technology or science, engineering, mathematics, uh, Olympiads uh, have happened in the past? And you know, in, in this, the former Soviet Union, there was a great tradition uh, of these sorts of events. And we have we have two veterans thereof. And the first one is Timur Kim, who uh, is a senior scientist at Diamond Light Source, which is a not-for-profit limited company. Uh, and Timur, Timur, as I understand, is based in Oxford. It's funded as a joint venture between the UK Research and Innovation and Welcome Trust. And it provides national science infrastructure that's free at the point of use. The facilities are the National Synchrotron, along with the Cryo-Electron Microscopy uh, at the Howell Institute and Innovation Campus. And they're all available to researchers, uh, researchers through a competitive application process free of charge. And over 14,000 researchers from across the world, both from academia and from industry, uh, already use Diamond to conduct life and physical science experiments. And there's 700 staff. Um, and Timur, you, you, you are a veteran of this system of Olympiad in the former Soviet Union. And you've, you've taken that spirit, not only to become a brilliant researcher, not only to have all sorts of opportunities in the private sector, should you choose them, but to make available all these scientific research uh, capabilities in the UK, free of charge uh, to researchers. So in that spirit, could you tell us a bit about your own experience and the, the sort of platform that the Soviet system of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, Olympiads 
may provide us for what we're talking about today. Uh, thank you, Matthew. So, yes, I'm a physicist and working in UK, but yes, I was born in the Soviet Union. And actually, I take part in, in, in this uh, school science Olympic competitions like uh, mathematics, uh, physics, chemistry and biology. And in, in the Soviet Union, it's a long tradition. I looked in Wikipedia, it's actually started 1934. Wow. So and the first mathematic uh, competition was even in the Russian Empire by astronomy. Uh, 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 group started. But uh, I think in 1934, the main driving force was industrialization in Russia and the very big need for engineers. Mm. But this tradition develops very rapidly after 1967, when the government make a full support to it. And it was developed to the whole level. So each school in the Soviet Union, the uh, kids in every school can participate. So it was done that you can participate in a school level, then if you uh, win in this uh, competition, you go to the district level, regional, Republican level, and then all Soviet Union competition. So this was really like a pyramid to select the brightest people. And it, it's also ranged from several subjects. Uh, obviously, mostly important for us, it's a scientific one, but it also include geography and all the curriculum in high school. But uh, science was the uh, most uh, well developed in, in Soviet Union, and uh, this kind of competitions also lead to international competitions mm -hmm. between the countries. So it's also exists this international science Olympics, probably the most uh, famous against the mathematics, uh, and which several countries compete. Its uh, tradition exists for several decades, and if you look at statistics. Uh, again, Soviet Union probably initialized it and it was a first uh, driving force. But with time, things develop. And if you look on a uh, top 10 medalist in this competition over the years, you will see so now, for example, China is on the first place with quite a big advance. And then it's followed by countries like Russia, South Korea, United States, uh, Taiwan. So it's very popular in, in Eastern Europe and Asia. So there's uh, historical reasons. But this is very uh, great opportunity for the young students to attract attention. E even if you are from very small school, you if you are really bright and uh, can show uh, skills necessary, you can get to the top of your league and then attract the attention of the best universities. So this have a main function to get for the young people uh, to get a fresh blood in universities, uh, new talents. But it's also important because it's attract uh, kind of uh, attention for other people with in, uh, doing science. Unfortunately, as uh, mentioned, that it's not so well known for general public, uh, these kind of competitions, because again, it, it stays on this uh, pre-university level. There is also some university kind of competitions and uh, there's new subject appears nearly every year. I think the last year they introduced like a cryptography competition. Mm. So mm. You, you see that it develops starting from mathematics and now in more uh, interesting areas like robotics and so on. So, uh, and this is, I, I, I find it's very interesting and uh, also as, as a scientist working in this very international environment, I, I, I should mention that also we are UK national facility. We have uh, scientists coming from over the world applying for doing experiments with us. And again, I see many people, mostly like China, United States, uh, again, South Korea, Switzerland, Germany, uh, and the Japan, obviously. And then all, all these well-developed countries, they have a high tradition of, uh, of science and, and a very high education in science to compete. And that's why we know the main players who will be really interested. And again, I, I can name those. It will be obviously China, United States, Russia, South Korea, and uh, several European countries. Great, Timur. And, and also so interesting that you mentioned Taiwan, which is such a small country, right? Yet has such prowess in science and technology. And you, you just laid out a wonderful vision of, 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 of the fact that there are there is this infrastructure to motivate younger people up through about the age of 18. And you know, originally I planned, I'm sorry to go to Andrew next, but. Uh, Jose Ramon, could, could I come to you now? Because you you have founded a beautiful NGO 
that motivates young people who have graduated from uh, high school and even university uh, and, and to, 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 to continue their interest in science and technology. Uh, but be before we get into that, I just would like to say that you know, uh, Jose Ramon Calvo is the president of the Institute of Multidisciplinary Research in Spain. He's a full professor retired of health education at the University of Palmas. He's an epidemiologist. He's also <laughs> an expert on supercomputing. He's a strategic advisor of the Barcelona supercomputing sector, uh, a center. But he's also, for our purposes, so relevant that he's the founder and he, he's the operator of something called the Campus of Excellence. Focuses on climate change, many scientific issues. But these are young people between the ages of 18 and 25 who are interested in the challenges that in this case, the climate emergency presents today through concrete actions and projects. And uh, uh, Jose Ramon, I understand that in your upcoming uh, group of people at the campus for 2022, you've got some unbelievable, unbelievable figures, global figures to be involved to motivate these young people, including Bill Gates, uh, former U.S. Vice President Al Gore, uh, actor Leonardo DiCaprio, and U.N. Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez. So... What, what, what's your reaction to what Timor just said about there's this infrastructure out there that could get bright, young, scientific people up through the age of around 18 or 19 or even in their mid-20s motivated? <laughs> but after that, there's nothing. Maybe your organization is, is the one to keep them going. Please. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. Um I, I strongly agree with uh, everything that this was till until now. Um, regarding the, my experience on the past uh, uh, editions of Campus of Excellence, was created a long time ago, uh, more than 15 years ago, the first edition. Then we celebrate during five editions, and then we stop it because the lack of uh, economic support. And then we are trying to start again, uh, now focus on climate next year. Uh, but... The, the experience and the idea uh, that was uh, taken by Timor is more or less the same that we had. We focused on that time on students that was just graduated in the university. And then they, uh, we asked them to have a plan uh, to develop uh, or to explain like a thesis or something like that, that they are, they can be, uh, they can share with others and especially with a, a group of people, a very talented group of people that we invited, like Nobel laureates. We had uh, one of the edition 15 Nobel laureates together in the same week. And also we had a former head of state astronauts of NASA. Uh, mm -hmm. We had um, a lot of people. It was a very, very interesting. And then for the next one, uh, we are planning to, now it's a concept paper because obviously I have not invited anyone, but the idea is to have people uh, that can give them uh, the, the kind of, uh, not only the support or the knowledge, but the inspiration, because we are absolutely agreed that these are kind of Olympics that also I know some of them because here in Spain they celebrate the Olymp the, the mathematics and the physics, the Olympics in mathematics and physics. But uh, it's not like uh, Timo talk about in, in other countries because in, in Russia and, and uh, South Korea, etc., is like a tradition. But I remember, for example, I was inspired when I was in MIT, uh, visiting MIT, they have the Innovation Week. That is a fantastic idea that create during one week a lot of uh, innovative ideas that the companies can take advantage of that. And then I remember when I was visiting them, they, they explained very passionate about how they do that during every every year they have this innovation week that is fantastic. And then I was inspired with by that. In the case that we are thinking, uh, I, I think that we can put together some of the experience that I had on the past with the Campus of Excellence that because really uh, I can say that we was able to change the life of some people, many hmm. people. Is, I think that we'll, we, we changed the life of many of them because when you have the opportunity to share your ideas with brilliant people like a Nobel laureate nearby you because we have no any protocol at all. When you are inside of the event, you are the same having Nobel laureate, head of state or whatever, you are a student, you are uh, equal. And then they had the same opportunity to have a breakfast, a dinner or lunch with anyone. And then during this time, uh, there was a lot of opportunities to change, uh, interchange experiences and 
I, I, I know that some people change their lives during this, ex, uh, during this period of one week. And then, well, we are trying to recover this option and now focus on the climate. Why? Because uh, the climate is one of our mm, main important challenges. On the past, we did for different uh, issues. We talk about physics, chemistry, medicine, economics, etc. But actually, we are planning to do this next campus of excellence if we succeed to do it in climate, because I think that climate is sufficiently important to motivate and to have leaders uh, that uh, young leaders who can uh, lead in the future in different uh, fields regarding the biodiversity, sustainability, etc. And this is the, the the main idea. And obviously, uh, it's very easy to to fit with this uh, uh, technology Olympics because and 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 the same level is the same. It's uh, to have uh, probably uh, good uh, people, uh, people that are motivated, people that are interested on the advancement of science, and to be creative. And most of the time, we are trying to offer them to be out of the box. Uh, we, are, we are trying to create an, uh, new experiences for them. For example, I can put an, uh, an example. Uh, why not to, to imagine how can we create uh, something that is not already uh, created for resolving a problem? Uh, then we can discuss, we can talk, it can can be or not any solution, but at least as you have a lot of mentors that are surrounding you, that are very creative people and exp with expertise in different fields, probably it could be emerge some interesting idea. And this is the the main uh, idea of this uh, of this activity that I would like to to do again. And obviously, I will be more than happy to be part of this fantastic initiative of the Technology Olympics. Ah, Jose Ramon, thank you. So, so what you've just described is a, a vehicle you've created or a mechanism to take graduates of universities or high schools and keep them motivated and, and expand their minds and want to think about the big challenges that our entire world faces, especially, maybe most importantly, on climate, uh, which is related to pandemics through biodiversity. That right? is, we lose our biodiversity. The chances that a, 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 a virus is going to skip from animals to humans increases. So this is all interrelated. And on the theme of motivation, the point of the Technology Olympics, one of the many points is that it, it needs to motivate people. It needs to motivate the, the, the participants, but it also needs to motivate the observers, viewers. And so mm -hmm. we have a certain entertainment value. And so I'd like to turn to Andrew Fleck now to talk about that, because together we've been talking with Steve for some time about how to turn these various scientific, technological, engineering, mathematical events into something that's entertaining. I mean, there's a huge interest in uh, electronic gaming. I mean, the, the, the championships in electron, electronic gaming have huge audiences, as do the robotics competitions that Steve mentioned in the beginning. So Andrew's been thinking about this a bit for us. He's, he spent the last two decades investing in technology, uh, specializing in mobility and communication, security, software, and data analytics, lots of stuff. Um, he's the CEO of Growth Control Capital, uh, and that allows him to split his time between primary investment activities in the growth of in equity, and mentoring startups in the general technology space. And he has a heavy concentration on connected vehicle technologies, as does Steve, by the way, in, in one of his many ventures. Um, so, Andrew, could, could you tell us a bit about what you've been reflecting on in terms of how to generate the entertainment value uh, of the Technology Olympics? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, you know, I think it's important to understand that there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum of hard science that is really important and is often rewarded through the Fields Medal or the Nobel Prizes or some of these great, you know, scientific challenges that are out there that are somewhat reflective of lifelong pursuits. And then there's media. And media tends to be less than, you know, lifetime snippets. And we've got to figure out a balance. We've got to figure out a blend between what is scientifically uh, important and what is engaging. And I think that's the important word. We have to find content that engages the younger generation, that educates the younger generation, and content that is entertaining. Um, and as Steve referenced earlier, we don't have to solve this for every event that could potentially uh, you know, be part of this uh, Olympics. Um, but we do need marquee events. And this is where we're going to have to bring together those folks from 
you know, the media world and those folks from the scientific community and hopefully lock them in a room and get them to come up with tons of ideas or solicit ideas from the public, um, you know, at info at uh, technologyolympics.org uh, and come up with clever content. The good news is, is we've got a blank slate. Um, we have all opportunities to leverage all forms of media. This does not have to be television programming. It doesn't have to be exclusively on social media. We can leverage all of these platforms to distribute this content in a way that's consumable for those that want to be engaged with these different fields. Now, there's a multitude of different fields. And the good news is, is that they could change from Olympics to Olympics. We're not, you know, again, locked into any particular format, but math, science, you know, physics, chemistry, climate, bioscience, um, all of these are fair games, as are some of the practical uh, applied uh, sciences like engineering, like uh, uh, robotics, uh, you know, and so forth. All this content has to be engaging and, you know, we still have work to do to figure out how to make it. But I think what's important is that we think the time is right to do this. Uh, there's a lot of precedents. There's a lot of television programs that are out there that focus on science, that focus on uh, engineering, that have mass audiences. Uh, the success of the gaming leagues, like you mentioned, Matt, are very important. Uh, the online platforms like YouTube, uh, just try to fill your day with science and technology con content um, from these online platforms. And there's all kinds of engagement, millions of views, millions of subscribers, lots of interest from the general public. But I think more importantly, we as a society are becoming increasingly reliant on technology. And there's a desire to understand and use this technology from a practical standpoint. And I think an increasing desire to you know, be engaged with it in a way that provides not only knowledge, but the entertainment. And that's you know, very important. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Andrew. And, and the, how yeah, I love the point about how we're increasingly dependent on, upon technology. Of course, we are in the energy space, which brought, brought uh, Steve and, and, and me together and Murat and me together. I think of uh, a passage in uh, Dan Jurgen's epic book, uh, The Prize, which I did not finish because it's like 75,000 pages long. But somewhere in there, there's a, uh, a passage where it's a quote of a U.S. government official who says, uh, all of the world's greatest oil basins have been discovered. From now on, we're at you know, peak oil. Uh, the price of oil will increase uh, forever because we know there's no more out there than what we've discovered. Uh, and that was written in like 1912. <laughs> so technology has developed so far. We've grown so much more dependent on it. And it's technology that is getting out of this, God willing, this pandemic, right? Who would have imagined a year ago that so quickly we'd get a vaccine to end up to our arms within a year when usually it takes at least 10 years. So technology is what we're going to need to rely on uh, to survive. Um, and at the same time, well, I guess in the theme of practicality, we have to find a way to make sure that the technological Olympiad uh, will be commercially viable, maybe not so much as a business, but it's got to be self-funded, right? It's not going to be something that governments subsidize. It has to be something that can... Uh, attract sponsors that's sufficiently attractive, not only in terms of entertainment value, but from a corporate perspective uh, to, 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 to get corporations or, or whomever else to fund it. So I'd like to explore this question with another one of my dear friends, Murat Saitnipiasov, who is a truly visionary person, who's a, a plasma physicist who uh, uh, studied at the Turkmen Polytechnic University in economics and management, simultaneously at Novosibirsk State University in theoretical physics. Um, he spent some time doing practical physics work, and then he started nuclear physics uh, at the Siberian branch of the Academy of Sciences, uh, but then realized maybe he has an interest in economics, as his degree from Turkmen Polytechnic University suggested. So he worked uh, for a while at the Central Bank of Turkmenistan, uh, yeah, he says he he calls himself a leading specialist of the economic analysis department, but he is way more. He was the head of external relations uh, for the uh, Bank of uh, Turkmenistan. And I know from his own personal stories that he did unbelievable things in finding ways to market relatively obscure commodities produced in Turkmenistan according to the five-year plans uh, in, in the West, in Canada and in Europe, and has built 
commodities trading companies, including Integral in Geneva, uh, but uh, uh, transportation companies like Steve did, tankers that ply the Caspian Sea, uh, a whole series of energy-related companies, uh, all beginning with plasma physics background. So, Murat, you're not only someone who's made the transition uh, from a hardcore science to business, uh, but you are also a champion uh, in Turkmenistan in uh, the Mathematical Olympics. Could, so could you tell us a bit about that experience as well as your thoughts as somebody who's made this transition from science to business as to how we might come up with a viable economic model to make a technology Olympics succeed? Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, maybe we'll start, uh, I will start from the beginning. Uh, when I was a child, I was 14 years old, and uh, just occasionally I participated in the Olympiad Olympiads in physics. And uh, just occasionally I won this Olympiad. <laughs> I didn't understand how it how this happened. Uh, and then uh, I was living that time in Turkmenistan. Uh, that time it was Turkmen Republic of the Soviet Union in the capital called Ashgabat. And uh, usual school, normal school. Uh, and then I was invited uh, to Novosibirsk, to the special school for physics and mathematics, and they did the summer school uh, to select the future students for that uh, specialized school. And it was some kind of a miracle. Like, you are from Turkmenistan, a usual child, simple, and uh, coming to the Akadem Garadok, uh, that time uh, uh, there were like more than 20 scientific research institutes, and there was a Siberian uh, branch of uh, Soviet Academy of Science, not yet Russian. And uh, you could see on the streets, academicians, professors, doctors, everybody. And uh, what I was surprised that uh, people uh, on the street, they are talking about science. Wow. They are not talking about what to buy or to sell or to do what. Uh, they were just mainly, uh, if you start to listen, they were talking about science. And then I was thinking, okay, this is the place where I would like to be. Wow. And then <laughs> after one year, because I was a little bit early, I was a little bit young, and it was early for me to start uh, with a specialized school in physics and mathematics. And then I, uh, I was accepted. And then next year I came uh, to Novosibirsk and uh, started uh started my study then and uh what i also what was very interesting there was no any like strict discipline in that school <laughs> uh, it means you could decide practically up to certain extent of course what you would like to study where you would like to go uh the main thing was to pass the exams afterwards <laughs> uh, which was very interesting uh system and uh then i uh after finishing that school, of course, I went to the Novosibirsk University uh, for the, uh, to study physics and then uh, specialized in the uh, nuclear physics and then exactly plasma physics. And, uh, but uh, later on, when, while I was studying and I was graduated from the university, uh, the Soviet Union crashed and collapsed and completely. And I understood that uh, practically uh, there is no possibility to live, even survive in such environment with the salaries like five, six dollars a month, uh, being the junior scientist in this uh, scientific research institute. That's why I decided really to switch for a business. Uh, and then I came back to Turkmenistan and started business. Uh, but what I would like uh, to tell here that uh, during that exercise, I, I was able, uh, okay, I was able to catch the educational lift from Turkmenistan, usual school, uh, to the probably the best school in the former Soviet Union, specialized in the uh, physics and mathematics at least. And uh, th all that happened thanks to these Olympic Games in physics mm -hmm. and mathematics, which I participated and uh, occasionally won some, some of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, this was an educational lift. Uh, and uh, this, this system still exists up to today in the former Soviet Union, in Russia at least. Uh, and we discussed uh, recently with the people who are still organizing these Olympic Games. Uh, but uh, there are no such lift for the university graduates, mm -hmm. for example, for the young professionals, for the young scientists, young engineers, young specialists. And uh, then 
let's say if you are graduating from the university, you are starting your career. And in, in science, it will take really ages while you will move through these career steps, step by step, step by step, and so on. But of course, uh, uh, not for 100% of the scientists, but uh, really for 99.9%. And, uh, uh, and I think what is needed here, the social lift, or let's call it scientific lift, for the young professionals, young specialists, young scientists, uh, who could get, uh, like winning such Olympic Games, who could, could get proper financing, proper research infrastructure, proper even teams, and not wait when they will be 70 years old and they will be recognized by the whole world, like Nobel Prize winners and so on. Mm. Uh, with, again, with some exceptions, I'm not telling about 100%, but mainly. And uh, I think uh, this idea could be the great opportunity to create this scientific lift or social lift for the young professionals, which is not existing now. Now, uh, to be famous in science, you really need to do something extraordinary, completely extraordinary, like happened with the graphene, uh, with the two Russian guys <laughs> doing graphene practically uh, on the table without uh, very complicated equipment, but they did it, they got the Nobel Prize, they are really recognized by everybody, but these are rather exceptions. If you will see, uh, the Nobel Prize winner's average age, I think, is close to 70 years old. And it means they spent already all their life and only after that they're being recognized. But uh, based on this idea of Olympic Games, uh, young scientists could be recognized much earlier stage. Uh, really, after they're winning Olympics, they're like national heroes or international heroes. And then they could get all resources for them to continue their scientific career. And I think this could be... Uh, the main goal, I'm not talking now about uh, business or financing or monetization, I'm talking about the social importance of such idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now, and I think, uh, all I believe that today is the right moment for such initiative, for such project, uh, because uh, the whole society and, uh, and scientific society was quite well shaked. Uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, because of the climate problems, and also because of the digitalization of the world. And uh, fourth industrial revolution and the World Economic Forum uh, definition was announced like four years, five years ago in 2016. And now it's really, uh, it's, uh, 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 really uh, running. And... Uh, now, how to get support? And I think here also the great possibility for corporations, for the governments, uh, for the research institutes to get brilliant young scientists. And for that, they are ready, I believe they are ready to pay and they are ready to donate, they are ready to, to subsidize uh, such uh, Olympic Games. And uh, I don't think there will be major difficulties if it will be properly promoted, like Andrew and Steve uh, just mentioned. Uh, people will know, people will join, people will support because there is a social importance and also there is a possibility for the monetization and uh, possibility for the business, not for the project itself, but also for the future consumers of this product. Like uh, because uh, for who, who can then hire the young scientists and will be able to use these young scientists to produce something good for, for the world and for the business also. Uh, this is just my main ideas, and I think we are running out of time. And uh, yes, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Murat, yeah. No, no, it's, uh, uh, th 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 these are the main ideas, and I think there will be no big issues with the support uh, for such initiative for the uh, multinational corporations, from the governments, from research institutes, and from the society, because it's bringing value, really, to everybody. Thanks, Thank Murat. So, yes, we are just about out of time. We just have a couple more minutes. We're going to get cut off at any time. Um, but, yeah, you raised some really important points, a, a set of different points, and and things or goals that a technology Olympiad could could achieve. One is identifying these brilliant young people that might not otherwise be found 
And, and I, I also know the story of your father who grew up in an obscure village in Turkmenistan and the Soviet system found him because he was such a brilliant guy and brought him to Leningrad. And that led to your life as well. Um, so that, that's one thing, identifying these brilliant young people. And then there's the motivating them after they graduate from university, as, as, as Jose Ramon was talking about. He's got a mechanism to keep them motivated and get them thinking more widely about the world other than just about either making money or their narrow scientific research, but doing something good for the world. And then there's the issue of monetization, as you mentioned, and that there are a lot of companies out there that are going to want to benefit from getting to know these brilliant scientists. And then as Steve, as you've talked about privately with me, there's the whole idea of national competition and the fact that, you know, the great powers you know, like the United States, Russia, China, but little powers like Israel and Estonia who have great technological prowess, they can be competing together in something like this. And it doesn't matter who has the biggest population or the greatest GDP. It's the brilliance of the minds that happen to uh, to, to exist in each of these countries that are going to be competing. So there are a lot of great things that com can come out of this. We don't have the answers about which one of these four sets of objectives uh, ought to be pursued because they all should be. But in the few moments we have left, Steve, since you, you're the real brainchild of all of this in our group, I just would like to throw the floor back to you to summarize and, and, and react to all these comments before we run out of time. <laughs> Well, the only, thing I, the only thing I would add in the limited amount of time that we have is, first of all, thanks for putting this together. It's been really um, gratifying to see the immediate support that, that this idea has gotten from so many different people that we've spoken to, whether it's in media or in the scientific community or in the, in the political and diplomatic communities. Um, I would just encourage more people to get involved. Um, it's going to take an enormous amount of effort to, to get this, um, to bring this to life. And once again, um, please reach out, info at technologyolympics.org. We'd love to hear from you and um, could use all the help that we can get. Sure could. Thank you, Steve and Timur and Jose Ramon and Andrew and, and Murat. Spectacular people. You have all accomplished such amazing things in your lives. And let's, let's pool all of that creativity and success and help this next generation of young thinkers be recognized and motivated and be contributing to helping us all avoid the next pandemic and climate disaster before they're 70 years old and get their Nobel Prizes. <laughs> thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Matthew, for moderating this panel. And also special thanks for Dr. Frank Richter, uh, chairman of Horasis, uh, to providing the platform uh, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this panel and uh, for the possibility to discuss. And, uh, thank, thank you, and congratulations for the fantastic idea. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, as well. All right, guys. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.